So last time we introduced these arrow types, types of the form P arrow Q for some types P and Q. And we talked informally about what that means and how to interpret that logically. And we also played around a little bit in the computer formalism and saw how to actually write terms of these types. But now I want to cover arrow types in our third way of doing hot, namely the hot deductive system. So remember that whenever we wanted to introduce a new type in our deductive system, then we needed to give a bunch of rules saying how to work with that type and how to build terms of that type and how to use terms of that type and so on and so on. So let's go through that development for arrow types. So the formation rule is pretty simple. It says that if P is a type and Q is a type, then P arrow Q is a type. So note that I'm not just introducing one new type here. I'm introducing a whole bunch of new types. In fact, I'm, I'll be in, introducing infinitely many types because I can combine any two types that I already have by using this arrow. Also note that I'm going to be writing the contexts this gamma entails throughout because those are actually going to be relevant for this use. So there's the formation rule, asserting that this is a type. And then we have already seen our iteration rule, which tells us how to use things of this type, namely modus ponens. So modus ponens says that if I have something of type P arrow Q, and I have something of type P, then I can get something of type Q. And so I already started using this notation last time, that if f is my term of type p arrow q, and p is my term of type p, that f applied to p, like this, is the resulting term of type q that I get out of modus ponens. And you'll all, you see vari variations on this, so you'll also see it written like this, or like this. So all of those, whenever I juxtapose f and p like that, it means apply f to p to get my term of type q. And so this is usually not known as an iteration rule. This is more commonly called the application rule. So those are so th those are two important pieces of the puzzle, the formation rule and the iteration rule. But there's one I skipped over, namely the introduction rule, which is a formal rule specifying how to build terms of this new type I'm defining. And it turns out we don't actually have all the machinery we need to do that yet. So let me introduce a few new concepts. So remember that when we're in the deductive calculus, we work with contexts. So what a context is, it's a finite list of typed variable declarations saying all the free variables I'm allowed to be using in my term. So it's something like x1 of type a1, x2 of type a2, etc. So some finite list of typed variable declarations. And these variables can be used to come up with terms in context. So if my context is x1 of type a1 all the way through xn of type an, then in particular, in that context, x2 is a term of type a2, and x1 is a term of type a1, and etc. So that's what the context is for, is to give me these typed variables that I can use in forming new terms. So if we want to be really precise, then we have to be a little bit more formal than saying a context is a finite list of typed variable declarations. If we're being formal, what we really say is that we have an empty context which contains no variables. And then if I have a context gamma and a type A in context gamma, then I can extend gamma with a, a new variable X of type A. So this is called context extension. And I assume here that X is a fresh variable name, which means that gamma hasn't already declared a variable called X. And so if I have a context like X1 of type A1 through Xn of type An, what this means is that in the empty context, A1 is a type. And then in the context consisting of just X1 of type A1, A2 is a type. And in the context of x1 of type a1 and x2 of type a2, a3 is a type, and so on and so on, until I get to this point where I have all but the last variable, and then in that context, an is a type, 
And then that allows me that I can extend that context one more with Xn of type An, and that gives me the context I have at the top here. So this is more formally what we mean by a finite list. And so this, this operation of context extension is going to be necessary in order to state the introduction rule for the arrow type. And this introduction rule is called lambda abstraction. So remember, this is an introduction rule. So I'm trying to say, how do you write a term of type P arrow Q, specifically in some context gamma? And so if I want to write a term of type P arrow Q in context gamma, then I'm going to do what I did in Agda last time, is that I'm going to assume something of type P. So I have a variable, let's call it X of type P. And then using that, I write a term of type Q. And so if I can do that, if I can write a term of type Q, perhaps using my variable X of type P, then I can lambda abstract that away to get a term lambda X dot Q, which is of type P arrow Q. And so this is the lambda abstraction rule, which is used for introducing terms of this arrow type. So a couple things to note about this. First of all, the context is changing. So on the top of the rule, my context is gamma extended with a variable X of type P. And so I'm allowed to use that variable X inside of Q. Whereas on the bottom, the term I get lambda X dot Q is a term in context gamma. So the X goes away, it gets wrapped into this term. And then the other thing to note is that Q can depend on X. So we've already seen examples of this. So remember the, my term id last time, which witnessed that P arrow P. So there, little p is both, is playing the role of both X and Q because it's the variable I assumed but it's also the term of type P that I'm producing. And so we've already seen context extension in Agda. When I'm writing this ad veritatum, for example, then the context is everything that is already in scope here. But then I extend that context with an assumption little p of type P. And so all that the rule of lambda abstraction says that is that if I want to produce a term of type P arrow unit, then in this context extended with a variable of type P, I need to produce a term of type unit. And so it would be exactly the same thing to write ad veritatum is equal to lambda P. And then in Agda we use, instead of a dot, we have a, another arrow. And then I just write the star. And so this is the same thing, is it's a lambda function, which takes in uh, a little p of type p and produces a term star of type unit. So this is the exact same thing as I, how I had it before. And similarly, I could write id is equal to lambda p to p. So remember this type definition checklist, which says, if I want to introduce a new type, then here are all the rules that I need to provide. So for our arrow types, we've already talked about the formation rule of like, how do you get the P arrow Q type? And then we just covered the introduction rule, which was lambda abstraction. And then we just did the iteration rule, which is our modus ponens or application rule. The main thing that we have remaining to give is this computation rule. So remember, the computation rule gives judgmental equalities which specify how the iteration rule works. This is going to be our first example of a very common trend of having two different kinds of computation rules. And the computation rules for arrow types are very well known, and they're known as the beta rule and the eta rule. So what the beta rule does is it tells us what happens if we 
use our introduction rule, namely lambda abstraction, and then immediately use our iteration rule, application. So beta is what happens if I apply a lambda abstraction. So here's the beta law. It says that if I have a term little q of type big Q in the context gamma extended with x of type p, so remember this was the kind of thing that we needed in order to do a lambda abstraction, and then I also in context gamma I have a term little p of type p, then what happens if I lambda abstract this q to get lambda x dot q, so that's of type p arrow q, and then I immediately apply that to p. And so what the beta law says is that if I do that, then the term that I'm going to get is the same thing as q, where I've substituted little p in for all occurrences of x. So this idea of substituting is something you can kind of tediously define uh, really carefully, and if I wanted to be fully formal, I would have to. But intuitively what it is, is I go through and anywhere where I see the variable x, I just replace it with an instance of the term p. And so what beta is telling us is what does, what does it mean to apply a lambda abstraction? And so beta is saying that if I apply a lambda abstraction to a term, then that's the same thing as substituting that term in for the variable. And so to see the beta rule in action, I'm going to use uh, another example of the natural numbers. Let me write a function suck, which takes a natural number and returns another natural number. And I will say that suck is equal to lambda n to n plus 1. And so this is the same thing, is that if I have uh, a little ter a term little n of type natural number, then n plus 1 is also a term of type natural number. And so if I lambda abstract it like this, then I get a, type, a term of type natural arrow natural. And so to, so to see the beta rule in action, let me normalize a term, and I'm going to say suck of 5. And so this is a lambda abstraction applied to a term. And so the beta rule says that in order to compute this, what I do is I take my term in the context, and I replace the variable that I'm taking in with the thing that I'm applying this to. So in this case, I'm going to substitute this 5 in for n in the body of this function. And so that so this suck of 5 will compute to 5 plus 1 by the beta rule, and then we know 5 plus 1 is 6. So that's what the beta rule says, is that applying a lambda is substituting the argument into the body of the function. And then eta is kind of the opposite of beta. So beta is says what happens if I apply a lambda abstraction? Eta says what if I lambda ab abstract an application? So here's the eta law. Eta says that if in context gamma I have a term f of type p arrow q, then if I form the term lambda x dot f of x, so you can check through the the abstraction and application rule to see that this is going to be a term of type p arrow q. And in fact, it's going to be the same as f itself. So the eta law says that lambda x dot fx is the same thing as just f itself. So I encourage you to think a little bit more about what eta is saying, but intuitively what it's saying is that every term of type p arrow q, every function from p to q, is essentially a lambda. So going back to our checklist, we see that we have supplied our computation rules. 
Now, technically, I need congruence rules here that say that judgmentally equal terms of type P arrow Q behave the same way, and, and that if I replace things with judgmentally equal things in my lambda abstraction and my application rule, that I'm going to get judgmentally equal results. But I'll leave those for you to ponder. And so that's all I'm going to say this time about, about arrow types. We're going to see, be seeing tons and tons of arrow types throughout. They really form the core of doing constructive logic in type theory. So even if, so even if they don't 100% make sense at this point, you will get plenty more exercise with them. But let's go ahead and move on to another thing.